Okay. So I've been asked to, to talk a little bit about this. Um, we're going to be talking about guidelines and checklists coming up. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the things that we're seeing wrong and um, why that matters. So we hear a lot about heat pumps in the media these days. If you, if you believe them, it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. And it is a great technology that is proving itself in some very challenging climates. Um, we're looking for ways to reduce the reduce energy usage and improve comfort. And 44% uh, of residential energy is committed to heating and cooling. Um, and so heat pumps are a great option for that. They heat and cool. They're versatile. You can use them in new construction, retrofits, ducted, ductless systems. Um, and they're 300 to 400% efficient um, in, in their use of energy. Um, and also three to four times more efficient than a typical high efficiency furnace. That being said, DOE has found that 70 to 90% of the ins installations had at least one fault in them. Um, and when you included ducts, the duct system in that, it increased almost 100%. Um, improper installation leads to increased energy use uh, on an installation and can also uh, uh, lead to higher repair costs over the lifetime of the of the uh, installation and the equipment. Um, every error, every shortcut degrades the efficiency, performance, and satisfaction of the HVAC system. And that affects everyone involved. It affects the residents, the contractors, and the grantees. Um, I'm here to kind of give a plug for the QA program. We are here to help. We want to help you on the front end design a, a system that's going to work for your customers. And we would rather help you do it right the first time. We're, we don't want to be out there faulting you and, and requiring callbacks and things like that. So what are we seeing in the field? We're seeing three different categories. Design, designing the, uh, an appropriate system that's going to serve the, serve the purpose necessary. Sizing, making sure it's the equipment's the right size to provide that comfort to your customer, and installation, making sure that it's put in properly and performing as designed. Um, I also want to point out this is not a technical training. We're not here to show you specifically what to do. Refer to your manufacturer's installation uh, guidelines on that. Uh, also, manufacturers do offer training for all of their their equipment. So if you haven't taken advantage of that. Make sure you're getting that training from them so you know the proper way to install the, the particular brand and equipment that you're working with. So here's a list of a lot of the common things that we're seeing in the field. Um, I'm not going to read through all these here, uh, but they're, these fall into those three categories. The main thing I want to emphasize with all of these is if you follow the manufacturer's installation instructions and the PSEP checklist, you can avoid all of these problems. And that's what that's what we're hoping to do is minimize minimize the installation issues, minimize those callbacks, minimize the complaints from the customers. So I'm going to just show you a few examples of what we're seeing. Um, we're going to start with line sets here. So this is an outdoor unit line set going in. Um, anybody see anything wrong with this? <laughs> okay, yeah, a couple things going on. Number one, we've got uh, insulation is pulling off of the line sets there. Um, and so for those of you that don't know, this the insulation needs to be secured down so it's not pulling off. Um, and also they've cut the insulation short on this, so it's not covering the entire line set. Um, if you know the law of thermal, second law of thermal dynamics, hot always goes to cold. So if you've got if you're trying to warm the house running heat through there and it's cold outside 30 degree day, you're losing a bunch of heat off that copper before it ever even gets down the line. So um, th this is something we're looking for. Here's an example. So we had a we had to, we pointed this out. Uh, the installer got a call back on this. The solution that they came up with was adding some additional and taking that down. What you want is, is to secure that either with some, some 
uh, appropriate tape or a, a fastener of some sort to hold that down. They added an extra four inches onto that to cover the rest of that line set. Doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you start adding up the numbers, you've got two pipes on each, each uh, compressor there. There were 26 units total, so that's that's something where they need to come in. That's that's a day's work going in and doing that. So it's, you want to avoid those callbacks. Um, here's an example of uh, just some things we're looking for. Uh, insulation running up all the way to the nut there. Uh, we've got it secured down. They've also uh, taken and bound the two line sets in there just to protect them even more. Got wall coverings and foam in the end just to keep critters and things like that out. Proper mounting and clearance. Um, you want to keep that clearance. You want that airflow around the around the unit. And so, if you're in an area that has a snow accumulation or anything like that, you're going to want to have it raised up in some way on a base or a wall mount there. Um, that that middle picture there, I'm, that's a, a stock photo. I would I would question that. It, it, it's great to have mounted on the side of the wall. I would question why they're putting it under a functioning window there. That would that would be an issue in the design phase. It's something to look at there. But that's the most appropriate place to put it. But uh, in general, a wall mount is is perfectly acceptable and a great option in a lot of cases. Uh, this this one over on the on your right here. Uh, there's actually three heat pumps in there, and it looks, from this angle, it looks kind of like a mess. It looks like they're in there. There's actually plenty of room back there for circulation and all that. So that's that's something, when you step back there, it's okay. What we're looking though at, though, is just long-term with this one. Um, landscaper is going to keep grooming this to probably hide those. If that landscaper ever leaves, somebody else takes over, and that gets overgrown in there. You've got an on, you've got a problem that's kind of out of sight, out of mind. So, in terms of where you're mounting these and stuff, you want to make sure that there's that that ongoing awareness of what you're doing and keeping those clear. Um, this is an example here: two contractors on the same project. Um, so similar, they they've got a raised base that they're mounting that onto. They're bolted down. Everything looks good. The big difference here between these two was that they, they put some, some rubber grommets in there to absorb some of that vibration. Just a best practice there, something to look for. Talk about you know um, what we're what we're looking for in terms of that. We like the idea of seeing those best practices in there. Um, ongoing maintenance. Uh, some of the things to consider is what what's around so with, in this case you want to keep that keep the units free and clear and so we've got trees here trees are going to lose their leaves in about a month here and we're going to start getting accumulation you got to make sure that that that's included in your ongoing uh maintenance of management of the of the systems is keeping those clear somebody's going to need to to be aware of that be up there looking at those um, so that's something we look for and that we point out um, more as a, an FYI, not a, not a callback issue, but just something to be aware of is that those need to be maintained. Uh, also with ongoing maintenance, the indoor units require cleaning on a regular basis as well. Uh, each of the indoor units has a filter there uh, that needs to be cleaned um, usually one to two months uh, Every one to two months on the on the filter itself and on the unit, I uh, should get a full full cleaning and inspection. Usually twelve to eighteen months, depending on usage, depending on on the conditions it's it's in. Just want to point out that dashing guy there on the <laughs> upper right. Um, and one other thing that we look for, um, hopefully in the design phase, not not later on, is mismatch components. Manufacturers put together, uh, they they match up their components on that. Not all components go together. Um, and this is a, a screenshot of Mitsubishi. This was a particular indoor unit, and there's actually a section that says combat, compatible outdoor unit. So if, you, if there's any question, you can look at that, um, refer to your manufacturer or your distributor for, for additional information to make sure that those 
are compatible. Um, that's something that I ask for is documentation so that uh, we can we can verify that those are matched and, and function will function together as efficiently as possible. And I believe there's one more. So uh, condensate lines is another one that that we see a lot of. Um, they do produce condensation, and so you want to make sure that you're draining that in a, in a proper way. Uh, the picture on the left there, you don't want it draining over a, a patio or a walkway or anything like that. You get ice in the wintertime. Uh, they can get slimy in the summertime, slippery conditions, and you don't want to cause hazardous conditions for your customers. Um, here's a couple examples on this side. We've got uh, an indoor unit. We've got the drain coming through, and they've connected it into the downspout there, so it's, it's moving that away. Down here in the lower corner, they've got it on the outside. Main thing with something like that is you want to make sure it's draining away from the, the foundation or any crawl spaces or anything like that, but out into the yard, into a planter area or something, you can set up a drain. And... Sorry to interrupt you, but going into the downspout, really bad idea. I quite literally did that one time. We had the downspout plug up, the yard level and the downspout came above the condensation line to move back into the unit and ruin the sheet rock. Oh, interesting. Uh, okay. Yeah, down south, don't do it. Okay. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> okay, I'm going to go back one more just to show you quick here. This was a, some best practices we see. Um, like the idea of this, I was able to come in. Uh, the, there were multiple units for this. This was a multifamily project, so they contractor put a sticker on there, was able to see 105 is the unit number, 62 feet the line length, and they added eight ounces of refrigerant. So shows it shows that they were doing the proper calculations and figuring things out. Uh, there was no guesswork on my part of trying to figure out what they had done with that. Uh, another example here, they've taken the face off and they've written the information on the inside. Uh, long term, this is a Going to be protected from the weather, so a better way to do it, but you do have to take the cover off and know it's there to do it. Um, on the initial inspections, that made it super easy for me. I didn't have to do anything, but just take a look at that. Okay. And that let's see, whoops, I'm going the wrong way, aren't I? Leads us to our first trivia question. Name one of the reasons why proper installation of heat pumps matters. Show of hands, we've got it. We got it up. Oh, I saw a hand back there. Don't be shy. We, we've got prizes. We maximize the life of the unit because we solved it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. Okay. Uh, okay. And save money. And save money. All right. I believe, Greg, you are up next. <laughs> Hi, uh, my, my name is Greg Robinson. I'm the uh, quality assurance provider for round one of PSEP. Um, I'm also a private market contractor, so I've um, been installing heat pumps and weatherizing houses for over the last decade. So a lot of the lens that I'm taking here is more field based. Um, and we tried to combine that and make the heat pump standards for the program. So, can we dive into the point that this is not the heat pump standards? Standard capacity heat pumps are one of the standards we're trying to implement. And in, in creating the standards, we found a lot of different agencies define extended capacity heat pumps differently. They're also called cold climate heat pumps. So for the purpose of this program, QA providers are going to be asking for a heat load calculation that shows that the proposed heat pump will keep the indoor temperature at 68 in the winter when the outdoor temperature is 24 degrees and the interior temperature at 70. Five or seven. 78, 78 when the outdoor temperature is 100 degrees. So I have a question on that. For multi-family projects, especially these large apartment buildings, mm -hmm. are you guys going out to owners, sell owners, they're going to have to pay somebody to do the costs for these low calculations? Because that is a tremendous burden that gets thrown on design engineers at the end when somebody decides to go for these incentives. 
And the low calcs on a multifamily are somewhat irrelevant because the size of the unit ends up getting defined by the refrigerant pipe. Let's let's pick that up. Yeah. You know, let's have a conversation about that. But yeah, we're trying to make sure everybody knows it needs to be included in the cost. And um, but let's let's pick it up. Um, okay. Okay. So overview of the heat load calculation and why it is important. So for design temps, making sure we are putting the wrong size heat pump in a house is going to end up costing our homeowner more to operate by engaging the electric backup heat. Um, we're asking that you don't use the defaults in the heat load software. Um, go with the proposed insulation measures that are going to happen. Because if you model the house as is, and then you go and weatherize it, you're going to oversize the heat pump. Or if you assume that there's better insulation values than there really are, you're going to get undersized. Um, so we're also setting the size to retrofit conditions. Also, taking ducting when we're going from a gas furnace to a heat pump or an oil furnace to a heat pump, there can sometimes be sizing restrictions, um, taking a simple static pressure test, or if you have a flow plate, and just making sure you're doing your due diligence on the duct side, the duct side of things. Also, um, making sure you seal and insulate the ducting if it's not in the conditioned space to decrease the performance of the heat pump. Um, also, additional considerations for single zone ductless systems. We want to make sure that, one, um, we're not removing ducted gas furnaces from basements and installing single head or multi-zone ductless systems on the main floor. This can oftentimes drive up the moisture level in the basement, which can lead to some uh, building durability concerns. Also, we don't want to remove a ducted system and install a single zone ductless and leave certain rooms uh, unconditioned. So we want to make sure we're taking the entire house into consideration. Um, in addition to being extended capacity, um, kind of forces the hand at it, but we're asking for inverted German heat pumps with variable speed blowers. This is so that um, if we're designing at 24 degree outdoor temperature, most of our time is spent in the 40s. So we don't want a single stage heat pump going in that'll then end up being completely oversized for 90 some percent of the time. So when we're looking at our heat load calculations, we're gonna wanna look at our inverter driven heat pump in the minimum output versus the maximum output and just make sure that we're not oversized for the majority of the time that we spend at. Um, no, so in your lookout considerations, if you are installing backup heat strips, we want to make sure that we're setting the lockout temperatures at the, the appropriate level. Um, um, What's that? The I mean, the the trips. Yeah. 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 Great, repeat the question. You said that the heat stretches almost down. We saw the heat stretch of the second stage. Oh, second stage. Okay, yeah. Um, homes with electric force air furnaces, we're going to probably, not probably, we're going to recommend that you stick with ducted systems. Um, because we can have problems of putting a single zone, which we've seen on a few QAs, where you're putting a single zone ductless mini split in the main body and leaving the electric furnace in place. But those back bedrooms are still gonna be using that whole house electric furnace as supplemental heat. So the energy savings are likely not gonna be seen. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, when we do go from a ducted system to a ductless, we wanna make sure all areas of the home are receiving heat. Um, Cause if we have really cold spots, we can drive up moisture levels. Um, and as far as heat pumps go, I we really, really want to see the envelope measures being taken care of. Um, as a private market contractor that only does heat pumps, I can tell you that I the complaints that I've gotten about heat pumps not saving energy and uh, not keeping occupants comfortable are the ones that I've chosen not to properly weatherize. We've either foregone uh, wall insulation for cost reasons or attic insulation and um, those are the main callbacks we get because I oil and gas make you in feeling a little bit more comfortable than you really are. Uh, heat pumps with their lower output temperatures and uh, 
that can just cause comfort concerns in a leaky, uninsulated house. So we really, really want to make sure we're weatherizing. I do know grantees have a finite budget. So I was meeting with one yesterday where it's going to get complicated when you have a homeowner with a 30 year old gas furnace that you really want to swap out, but the house also doesn't have insulation. Um, so it gets tricky because you're not going to want to just use your whole budget to put in the heat pump and ignore the weatherization stuff. Because for one, it's going to drive up the cost of operation. And the second thing is it's going to um, probably not perform well and the occupants are not going to be that comfortable. So we just want to make sure we're taking the whole house into consideration mm -hmm. when we're doing it. Um, Bruce is going to get more into this, but I just thought that I would run up the sizing. This is a, a project we were released recently looking at. Um, and this is the two loads we had um, on the heating and the cooling side. And beyond the load cap, we, we really need to take into consideration our, the, the equipment that we're going to specify based on that load. Um, and here, I have not figured out, this is an inverted driven heat pump, but this line shows the size of the equipment that we are recommending. If I put the inputs right, that line should go downhill as the as that red line goes down actually go down um on this project we ended up saying we should go with a 24,000 BTU heat pump because what you saw before that that cooling load on this house is higher than the heating load in order to maintain that at 100 degrees we'd have to go with a little bit bigger of a system um we also looked at an 18,000 BTU heat pump um because it that it wouldn't meet the heating load but they do lose capacity as you start to go up in temperature in the air conditioning side. So the 18,000 BTU heat pump only gives you 14,000 BTUs of cooling, which would not have met the homeowner's needs. Um, and the 24,000 BTU inverter driven heat pump goes all the way down to, I think, 9,200 BTUs. So even though it's oversized, even at 15 degrees, <laughs> um, we're still fine at like 40, 45 degrees and not oversized. Um, so you can see here on this bounce point where those two lines intersect, this key pump's just gonna start to not, in theory, not keep the occupants at 78 or 75 degrees when it's 98 degrees out. So um, this was just supposed to be a brief overview of like beyond just doing the load cap, we really need to know our equipment and know the submittals pretty well. Um, Mitsubishi, I'm guessing other uh, manufacturers have it, but this is a diamond system builder where you can, uh, this is a diamond system builder where you put in the actual project and then it shows the D-range. So you can see that at 24 degrees, you're still gonna get 24,500 BTUs of heating, but um, you're only gonna get 20,000 BTUs of cooling out of a two ton. And then if we also, if you don't have that, all the manufacturers have the submittals and you can look at the minimum and the maximum capacities of the unit. So the minimum capacity of a two ton unit is 9,400 BTUs. So if we went back to that row cap, we would see that that house at 43 degrees or something is right around 9,000 BTUs. So we should still be okay. Um, and this is just as a, to show the minimum of the seven and a half is only 8,800. So it's not that much difference of a minimum between the two. So having a little bit bigger size to make sure we're okay on the cooling seems like the right decision. So beyond the sizing and installing the right heat pump, we need to educate homeowners on how to use it. It's definitely a very different heat source than a traditional gas furnace. Um, so we want to make sure that the homeowners know not to do wild setbacks for the most part. You know, if they're used to trying to sleep at 55 degrees and then when it's 68 degrees when they wake up, that's not really going to work because it takes a while for heat pump to get things going again. Um, airflow with heat pumps is very, very critical. So keeping the indoor unit and the, the indoor filters clean and the outdoor unit clean is imperative. We're recommending forage filters because they you can get a higher MERV rating without creating too much resistance on the unit. Um, 
we do understand that in some cases it's, it's not going to work, especially in filter grills um, and other things like that. Overview of the settings with the homeowners, um, leaving your system in auto, if you don't have a really defined schedule, can result in increased energy use because the, the heat pump will go between heating and cooling to try to keep a tight temperature band. Um, for most energy efficient use, um, you're leaving the fan speed in auto on a lot of these inverter driven heat pumps is, is the best practice because you can It'll modulate based on how far it is off from set temperature. There are, I think, some manufacturer specific stuff around that that I would recommend you talk to your dealers about because um, sometimes you don't want the fan speed in auto, especially in extreme temperatures when the system might not get to set point. Um, and then again, talk to the homeowners about recommended setback temps because the these do not heat your house up as fast as gas or oil. So just getting the homeowners um, used to this new technology and they'll be a lot happier. So. Okay. Thank you. Were you hearing me okay? Trying to figure out how close I got up. Very close. Very close. Very close. Very All right. Um, yeah, for the sake of time, I don't know where we're at. Kind of in the flow right now. Jason, do your best. Um, I'm going to try and make this as uh, smooth as possible. Um, and knowing full well that we've got a lot of experience in this room, um, a lot of uh, heat pump installations under the belts of a lot of folks here. Um, I got my thick skin on, so uh, do write down those questions, any comments, concerns you have about where we stand right now. Um, for the sake of the presentation, I've kind of hybridized uh, the checklist for both ductless and ductless, ducted and ductless as much as I can. Um, some of them is really just pulling out the, the ducted heat pump uh, installation checklist specifically. Um, and a lot of this stuff is going to be, you know, what we've already heard today. Um, this is just going to be, like I said, on the checklist form. Um, I welcome any and all feedback based on anything you guys find uh, in this today. I don't think the presentation itself has my email in it, but it's john.delance at everything. <laughs> Thanks, <dude. laughs> Um yeah, uh, so you know, before you begin, uh, we've heard this several times. Greg was just talking about the homeowner education. Um, I have done this enough times. I am a firm believer that that education starts well before you even started your project, and that is setting the right expectations in terms of how heat pumps perform and operate and deliver comfort um, compared to what has previously existed in the home until that point. Um, so having those conversations, and sometimes it can it can take a while, uh, but it is key to having your end user be as happy and comfortable as possible uh, when it comes to the investment you're making in their homes. Um, yeah, uh, inverter driven variable speed, variable speed motors, variable speed fans, right? We talked about that already. Um, Bruce is going to get more into the uh, specific training for heating and cooling load calculations. I'll save that for him. Uh, a lot of the stuff is just basic code compliance, right? Uh, you, your outdoor unit uh, needs to be on a dedicated circuit. You have to have a surface outlet, uh, some sort of disconnect there. Heat loads are going to be required. Heat and cooling loads are going to be required. Um, and to make sure, like uh, I think Greg and John are both saying, uh, design to retrofit conditions, not just the existing conditions. And I can't stress enough, again, like it already been said, if you're not including envelope upgrade measures with your HVAC upgrade measures, you're really missing an opportunity to ensure a better, durable, quality, long-term install with happy homeowners, right? Um, so again, if you need help with any of that stuff, well, I will work with each and every one of you as much as it takes um, to get you on board with that, because Every one of these points I'm making today, I've made the mistake out in the field myself and I've paid the price. So 
I'd love to save you that frustration if I could. Uh oh. What did I do? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> All right, we're done. <laughs> okay, so about that. Yeah, here we are. Um, specific on the detected side of things. Um, use the proprietary thermostat that comes with the equipment, right? Um, a lot of uh, name brands have come out popular in the last several years, and they've gotten the, the market adoption. But for the more experienced folks in this room who have run into these problems, you can oftentimes limit the full functionality that you just paid for with the equipment by putting on a non-proprietary thermostat. Some of, the, some of the best features of your heat pump can be degraded uh, by using what is more popular out there in terms of uh, a thermostat. Um, in terms of uh, location, this is best practices, right? This is why everybody thinks that, you know, for the last hundred years, what kind of furnace do you have? Honeywell. Honeywell's never made furnaces. Um, but where do you often see these things? In a hallway, right? Not on an exterior wall, not near a window, not near uh, a heating register or anything like that. Um, for productive retrofit applications, um, best to do a room-by-room -room pressurization test. If you don't know what that means, uh, give me a call and we can talk you through that. Uh, basically, you're just looking for, the quickest, quickest example I can think of is a standard box ranch home with high enough carpet and, and doors that aren't, you know, to communicate. You've got supply register in all those bedrooms, but when those doors are shut, you're not necessarily getting the return pathway to the return grill in the hallway, right? So you're pressurizing those rooms and you're not necessarily getting that, that proper airflow in and out and you're going to have problems. Um, so yeah, again, uh, if any of this stuff is new to you, this is our job to, to bring you guys up to speed on what these best practices are and how you do a room by room uh, pressure, pressure, pressurization test. All right, uh, more specific uh, applications for the ducted side of things. <laughs> no worries. Um, and yeah, I'll point out right now, if you guys haven't noticed already, there are some uh, inconsistencies on the checklist that you guys have printed out hard copies in front of you. The ductless checklist um, looks to be in pretty good shape right now. These are not the final forms, uh, specifically on the uh, ducted key pump installation checklist. There's a few things uh, that we caught at the 11th hour. Um, we're gonna be making those modifications, uh, but please, like I said, if you do have concerns, questions about any of that stuff, um, just reach out to us. Um, and we, we very much appreciate the feedback. Um, okay, specifically talking about the ducts when we're dealing with duct and heat pumps. Uh, teamwork makes the dream work, right? Uh, the best heat pump, highest HSPF, variable speed, inverter driven is only as good as the duct work that it is connected to. Um, so you have to address both. Um, honestly, I don't think enough HVAC contractors address the whole system, especially in retrofit scenarios, enough. Um, Duck work is not the high margin ticket item that the box is. Um, and when we're talking about, you know, inspecting and repairing uh, visible leaks, um, and we're really focusing on the, the that portion of the duct work that is in unconditioned space, right? Um, leaky ducts inside of conditioned space might not deliver the airflow uh, best to the rooms you're getting in, but in terms of energy loss, it's leaking into that same conditioned space that you're conditioning anyway. So we're really focusing on uh, attics, crawl spaces, uh, garages, anything like that where you do have exposed ductwork. Um, and we are going to require that any of that, that all of that ductwork does get inspected. Any visible leaks do get sealed with masking. Um, the, the, the oil UL-181 tape, I think is only supposed to be used at the, the air handler itself, right? So um, make sure that you are addressing those best practices. 
good, efficient, comfortable uh, system for your, your homeowners and tenants. For major duct modifications, um, if you see, if you come across ducts that just cannot be repaired or just catastrophic failure of the existing duct system, um, make sure obviously you're going to address that. Um, and you need to do a room by room manual J heat load calculation for that to ensure that the ductwork spe specified is going to meet the needs of the home and the system being installed. Pressure pan testing is highly recommended. Let us know if you don't know what pressure pan testing is. It's very simple. I don't hear this. You broke it again. I know. I'm a good lecture. A quick question. So you're requiring pressure pan testing versus duct testing? We are not requiring duct leakage testing. Correct. Yeah. Not even both work? No, not, not, not at this time. I would love that, though. That would be ideal. Um, that means more work for you all. Um, yeah, a uh, great example of what duct ceiling uh, looks like. Um, any of the rigid stuff, like I said, I heard somebody say Fuki just a little bit ago. Um, you're going to get your hands dirty with that stuff, but that's the point. Uh, that's how you seal that stuff. Um, and on the, the flex duct, you guys don't know how to properly uh, install and secure your, your takeoffs to your flex ducting with the, with the big rigid zip ties and stuff like that. Um, there's plenty of opportunities to learn how to do that. And yes, you can reach out to us if you do have questions on that. Okay. Right. Well, just, just use that arrows. <laughs> How are we doing on time, Jason? Good enough? Good, good, 15. Uh, yeah, Greg was talking about this a little bit ago. Um, four inch filters. Um, I have a huge, huge focus about indoor air quality. Um, I've worked in that field along with uh, energy efficiency, green building design, um, and I'm a strong believer, uh, especially when we're talking about the, the priority populations uh, and the whole reason behind those most affected by what uh, is going on with the world today and why PSEP you know, came to be as a program. Uh, four inch MERV 11 or higher filters. Um, anybody have questions about MERV stuff? The higher the MERV, the, the finer the particulate that's able to trap. Um, that second line there, the second check it anyway. Um, make sure that you're getting the right size filter. And this, I think I'm speaking more to the grantees in the room than the installers because, to my knowledge, you at the grantee level are going to have the more kind of upfront ongoing relationship with these homeowners and tenants more so than the contractor. And when you get to a point where you start replacing these filters, if you replace them with the wrong size and you get a bunch of air bypassing that filter, that filter is not doing anything for you. So this is a, a key component to make sure on the homeowner education side, ongoing plan maintenance, whatever your program looks like, uh, make sure that the right size filter gets in there and make sure that the actual uh, the face, the lid to that thing, seals tight enough to where you don't get blow by. That's what it's called. And like I said, you've got just air bypassing the filter assembly itself. <laughs> I'm not try it. <laughs> um, more specific for the duct and heat pump applications. Yeah. Um, true flow plate for uh, ensuring proper airflow uh, across the coil. Um, is key to ensuring, you know, proper design, comfort, efficiency uh, for your systems. We've said this already a few times today, but when you're fuel switching from gas or oil, the temperature of the air coming out of the heat pump is lower, so you need more air to deliver the same amount of BTUs. And if you're forcing that through the same ductwork, you can run into problems. Um, so this, uh, the, the true flow measurement uh, plate, that's how you ensure that you are getting the proper airflow across the coil and the ductive application so that you don't run into problems. And you will learn, if you haven't already, oftentimes in that scenario of fuel switching, modifying the existing ductwork 
uh, to allow for that greater air air travel over the coil is required. Um, more often than you, than you realize if you haven't run into those problems yourself. Any one of the most important things to do before starting installation? We got no prizes. Anybody? Anybody? Daniel J. Heat load calculations. Absolutely. Yeah, uh, going back to John's um, presentation, kind of what we see and what we get wrong, how often faults are discovered in heat pump installations, improper sizing is is very common, very common. If you are not, I know Bruce has got a whole handful of anecdotal kind of like stand at the curb and hold your fingers up and see how many fingers it takes to, to cover up the house or something like that. That is not a heat load calculation. Right? Sorry, I'm stealing your, your father there, Bruce. What, what about a uh, manual calculation? We are not requiring manual S at this time. Um, that's a great question. Okay, uh, I'm going to go this. Like I said, this did not take the place of manufacturer trainings. Get the manufacturer training on any type of equipment you are installing. Uh, I'm going to go through this like said, pretty quickly. Uh, for your outdoor units, uh, permanent pad, stable level surface. Uh, use risers, right, for the debris John was talking about, snow buildup. Uh, the deep rot cycle of your outdoor unit when it's trying to drain uh, the, the moisture that's frozen on that coil, you don't want it to refreeze immediately under um, the unit itself. Ice expands from water when it freezes, so you actually can dent the actual drainage pan at the very bottom and get problems long term if you don't do that. So you see the risers that are on there now. Uh, great way to ensure that you're never going to have that issue. Um, yeah, proper airflow. Um, especially for the smaller uh, ductless units and some of the ducted counterparts for, uh, that we're seeing now with uh, some of these manufacturers. Uh, use the bolts, adhesive, and make sure that stuff is secured to the ground. And the anti uh, anti-vibration pads for any sort of noise, cavitation issues you see with these systems. I have, I've made that mistake personally. Save me a bunch of frustration, don't ever do that. Um, for your indoor units, yeah, um, most often times it's going to be on an exterior wall, um, you know, secure, level plumb surface, installed in the, the main living area. Right now I'm talking primarily about the ductless units, right? If you're dealing with a zonal uh, existing heated house with baseboards or cadets or anything like that, your homeowners may be looking for that main unit to go in the main bedroom because that's where they like hanging out and that's where they like staying cool in the summertime. That is not best practices and that is not going to be um, allowed if that's the only unit uh, being installed. It has to go in the main living area so it can offset the most of the more inefficient electric resistance heat that exists at that time. And again, um, make sure you're not getting that thing too far. Close to the ceiling, I see these all over town, uh, restaurants and such, where I'm like, I don't think they can actually even, I don't, I don't even know if they have filters in there or they know filters exist because you can't break into that box without tearing the whole thing off. So, um, yeah, like I said, make sure that you know what the, the routine maintenance and cleaning looks like. Ductless units, if you guys have ever seen that with the bag and the jets, that's really interesting stuff, but let's save that for the future. Um, refrigerant tubing. Make your own flares. If you don't know how, that's part of your manufacturer's training. We can definitely educate you on that as well. Uh, create new flares every single time using the R410A flaring tool. I think, John, you got the copper over there. I'm not sure if you're going to bring that out or not. Um, refrigerant oil, using a torque wrench to get the manufacturer specified torque on those flare fittings. Um, going back to, again, what we get wrong oftentimes, improper uh, refrigerant levels, both too much and too little, exist all over the country way too often. Um, and a lot of times that can just be, through the life of the equipment, a very slow leak over time means that you're putting out R410A or soon to be R32 or anything like that. The GWP 
You guys know what that stands for? Global warming potential of refrigerant. R410A, I think, is uh, 2,088 times greater than CO2 alone. So if that's bleeding out a couple ounces a year, you know, half an ounce. Think about how much that is on a massive scale, you know, all across just the city of Portland with this program alone. So making sure you have good, durable, flared connections is going to help everybody in the long term. Uh, yeah. I've named a few of these already. I think a lot of us have. Who wants a, what do we got? What's the prize? Go for it. It's an improper flare. Improper flare. Great. Hot off the press. Indeed. <laughs> are we doing multiple, Chris or Wendy? Are we doing like multiple answers, or I don't know how much swag we have to, to give out? Okay, let's get another one. What's another common install problem? Uh, raise enough uh, platform so that when the concentrate drips out and freezes, it's not going to cause any issues on the bottom of the unit. Totally. Exactly. Yeah, during your defrost. People were doing business. The Antarctic break is two minutes. Um, but um, there, the one one mistake that is on the ducted checklist. There's incorrect information about condensate use. And please okay. make a note on the copy that we gave you that that is not the final copy. And that's a big mistake. Don't want to see that. You don't have money off. Yeah, the old line that says avoid condensated pumps. Um, if it's a you know central fan coil indoor ducted unit, they're essential, right? Uh, for obviously removing condensate uh, during the, the cooling dehumidification cycle uh, of your indoor unit. There's no heat. No heat I'm sorry. What I mean, we do the outside, whatever the case. Exactly. I haven't I haven't heard in a while, but if you've ever heard a condensate pump for the indoor ductless units, I've I've been around those, and it kind of sounds like a dying rabbit caught in a trap. Um, not the most fun. So if you can avoid those, yeah. please do. You said completely cross that out. Yeah, yeah. On the on the ductive ductive heat pump, it's saying avoid avoid condensate pumps. They come with the. They come with the they have the If you need to grab the drain, I would rather put Yeah. Um, if it's in chasing or something like that, sometimes you got four drains, sometimes you got to get to it. Oh, I had to do it. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, go ahead. Tom, I apologize uh, for the picture again going into the, the downspout. So we had our video or image library. So, so you, there. Um, yeah, make sure it's uh, sloped down and away from the building. Uh, screened off. Um, this one kept us, uh, some folks off guard a little bit, uh, specifically with the, the duct units where you've got the condensate drain line going out the same route that you do your refrigeration lines and the communication cable. Take it from me as somebody who had mushrooms growing in a two year old car in my back seat, only to find out that it was spiders that had crawled up the condensate line in my car, causing the blockage. And it was overflowing back into the unit. And I had mushrooms growing out of the carpet in a two year old vehicle. So it happens. Uh, a little bit of screen taped off your condensate line can help prevent that sort of issue. Um, small things go a long way. Um, yeah, refrigerant shards. 
The ductless units allow these outdoor units to come pre-charged. We saw the, the, the notification. If you do, if you have a really long line set, you have to add refrigerant, make sure you do that appropriately. Um, sometimes your refrigerant lines can be too short. Try and avoid that if you can. You get some cavitation noise issues as well. Um, consult with the manufacturer's guidelines about how to uh, deal with more or less refrigerant on there. And we talked again about you know using the inside of the service panel, the long-term durable notification of what those charge levels look like at the time of installation. Feeling the, uh, the the line hide, your line set cover. Um, got some caulking going here. I'm guessing those are Bruce's hand, but spray foam also goes a long way. Just again, make sure that you don't get debris, fritters, anything going out inside that uh, line as well. Uh, make sure your line sets, uh, the insulation around there is protected from UV uh, damage. I see homes all over town, brand new construction that are pre-piped for DHPs to be installed at some point in the future. And by the time those installs happen, the insulation on those pre-installed line sets are garbage. So you need to, you need to uh, wrap that up and protect it from uh, photo degradation, right? Commissioning. Yeah. Um, yeah, like I said, follow your installation, your manufacturer guidelines. Uh, commissioning, I'd say, is more important on the ducted side of things. Um, ductless, obviously, you know, assuming that your install went smooth enough, hitting the on button, using the best practices Greg was talking about uh, goes a long way. <laughs> Another trivia. Okay. Let's, let's go ahead and... Um, Let's give everybody a chance to take a break. So let's go ahead and skip this one. Okay. Main living area. All right. I think they're, I think they're in terms of uh, just the same thing we talked about with uh, homeowner education. Um, do not use auto mode. Use auto fan speed. Set the expectations with your homeowner that the, the air coming out of this heat pump might be different than the pre-existing gas furnace, right? Maintenance, showing them how to change the filters on your indoor heads. It's very simple, um, goes a long way. You can just rinse those off in the sink, let them dry, put them back in. Um, it does go a long way. We've got, we've got uh, a hard copy handout in the packet provided for you of what some of those like ongoing homeowner education materials can look like. Um, there's a lot of materials out there. Um, like I said, feel free to uh, let us know if you have any trouble finding those. Another example, I think that's what we have in there. Automatic fan speed. Limit your setbacks uh, between daytime and nighttime. Uh, better leave that thing up at you know highway speed, your adaptive cruise control, uh, you know that heat pump inverter going through the night. Um, it saves you a whole lot of comfort complaints and actually efficiency as well. Um, if it doesn't have to jump into high mode to bring your, your set point temperature, you know, 10 degrees higher because you're setting it down too low at night. Sounds broken record. And yeah, the last one there um, for the more uh, the, for ductless heat pump installs, when you've got the, the other bedrooms and such, make sure that you're prioritizing the use of the most efficient workhorse in that house being the DHP over those backup zonal systems and make sure your homeowners know how to do that. Yeah, we all know that. <laughs> I think we all know that. Said more of those already. This just means everybody can come and pick up a car and Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Why should piece that fun heat pumps be inverter driven in variable speed units? Going back to at the very beginning when Chris and Wendy were talking about, because we're trying to save energy, trying to reduce emissions, trying to make happy homeowners and tenants. We're trying to do all that at the same time. Heat pumps are great, but only if they are designed and installed correctly. We cannot be a program where we're increasing utility costs for these tenants and homeowners. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, five, five Five, ten minutes break? Yeah, ten minutes. Ten minutes. Fred and Lane, turn back to your desk. Thanks for watching.
How are y'all doing? Yeah. If you take your caffeine and your Red Bulls in, because I'm going to be really boring. Okay. What do people want from their heat pumps? Comfort. Comfort. What else do they want from their heat pumps? When do they want it? Okay. So we've established the design parameters for getting heat pumps into people's homes. Okay. So those are our goals, right? So load calculation. If you can't hear me, I will use the mic. In fact, can y'all hear me? Okay. So yeah, this was, you know, when I got in, it was one ton for 400 square feet. I've heard one ton for 500 square feet, one ton for 700 square feet. So my saying is rules of thumb and dumb. Okay. I mean, it was like, yes, this rule might help, might work on a given house, but it might not work on the house across the street. Okay. And then we have these little templates. If you stand across the street, it's a curb. There's a template covering the house. You know, there's a kind of entity. You, know, you got the biggest template, and that was going to be the, the size of it. Uh, this unfortunately probably became during the supply shortages. Maybe to the selection committee right there. What could I not? Okay, so there, there we go. I just want a half times bigger than my neighbor and 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 others. Okay, so. First step, you've got to define what space you are actively going to condition in the house. And that thermal boundary is that sort of imaginary line that you can put. That's the space that we're going to try to describe in the heat loss model that we're going to try to heat and cool. Okay, so design conditions. It's not the coldest day ever in Oregon, and it's not the hottest day ever in Oregon. It'd be ridiculous to size an air conditioner for 115, even though that's where we all got a few years ago. It'd be grotesquely oversized when it was 90. It would cycle on and off, and people would not like you. Okay, wind design temperature is 23 in Portland, the words. And there's been lots of discussions about cold climate heat pump, and do we even need auxiliary heat? Maybe that's a debate for another time. Okay, so I'm old. And when I start first doing my first heat loss calculation, it was really cool because we just got our first hand calculators and we no longer had to remember multiplication tables. Okay. So the saying back then was garbage in, garbage out. Unfortunately, once we get a computer involved in the middle, because it makes all the it makes all the really good graphics. We think if we put garbage in, we're all going to get gospel out and we'll spread the truth, right? <laughs> you know, most important, here's the secret about heat loss math. It's addition and multiplication. It's not complicated, okay? So lots of talk about manual J and all this other stuff. At its heart, it's addition and multiplication. So it's not the calculation that counts as much as the inputs. So today, we're going to focus on what are reasonable inputs to put in. Okay, so we always got to think what the customer wants. <laughs> when, when do they want it? Now. Okay, so they want it now. Okay, got to keep that in mind. Okay, so when we size for gas furnaces, you know, we need to know the square footages and the R mu values of all the surrounding areas in that thermal boundary. And then, if our ducts are outside the house, there's an energy penalty to pay for that, and that's called the duct multiplier. And we have the ACA frame, which stands for air changes per hour. How many of y'all do lower your test here? Okay. You do it on every house? Oh, okay, good, okay. Good, good for you. Sometimes, maybe not always. Okay. If you're doing the lower doors, that helps you narrow the estimate, if you will. Okay, it's always kind of an estimate. But if you're putting a gas furnace in, these babies come in 20,000 BTU increments. So I'd like to go down to the order desk and say, hey, Bob, I want a 46,232 BTU gas furnace. 
50 people that are also going to go to work and make you one of those, okay? <laughs> they come in big chunks of 20. So some of the, the level of exactness you need for a gas furnace, you know, <laughs> ain't that much. Oh, and then we talk about cooling loads and sizing heat pumps. These come in 6,000 BTU increments. <laughs> you think you need to be more exact when you're sizing heat pumps in air conditioning than you do with gas furnaces? Yeah, I think honestly, gas furnaces in Portland, Oregon, most of y'all are in enough homes. You could probably use a few rules of thumbs and have it work out for you to tell you the truth. Okay, when we talk about cooling and people want to be cool in summers, windows become really important. <laughs> What direction do they face? Especially that east and west facing glass with that sun and gold in the sky. Just hit that glass straight on. And something called the solar heat gain coefficient. Solar heat gain coefficient, roughly speaking, is the percentage of solar radiation that hits the outside wing and enters the house and starts to heat up the house. Okay, the lower it is, the better that, that window is at stopping solar radiation from heating up your house. Okay, so we had a bit of that, that duct multipliers. How many of y'all been in an attic in the summertime when it's 90 degrees outside? <laughs> okay, aren't you glad you're inside? You know, <laughs> how hot is that attic? <laughs> Too damn hot, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's really hot. So, What's the temperature of air conditioned air coming out of an air conditioner usually? <laughs> what? 50, 55, so we'll call it 55, right? And it's a best, we've got R8 ductwork on there. <laughs> Going into a 130 degree attic, right? Meanwhile, we got an R49 on the attic, right? And, you know, so ducts matter, matter, matter. Okay. So this is done for uh, Denver. I wish I had more time. I've redone it for, for Portland. But what this is, this is what I used to try to dissuade people that so many times per square foot. So if I have an R4, I need, well, we'll call it 800 square feet to give me 12,000 BTUs of heating motor. Dang. By the time I get to R11, it's 1,800 square feet I need to give me 12,000 BTUs. But once we get out here, so tell me I need the size for BTU square foot without even looking at the R values. It's all about the heating and cooling load. It's not about how big the house is. Okay, this is um, a slightly abbreviated history of Oregon code. So if you're working on newer homes, this is the minimum that house had to be built to. Okay? And this, these, these actually work. And we've done enough code studies to know that insulation and window codes generally get enforced. Pre-1973, is it safe to assume there's no insulation in the house because code didn't require it? No, it's not at all. People build their dad insulation because it works. Utilities have been stuck in insulation in homes since the early 80s. Low income agencies, they have been insulating homes since that time, too. So just because the house is old, don't say R0. And as and other speakers have said today, do the heat loss calculation for the way the house is going to be, not the way it is. <laughs> and if you are going to put a heat pump today, and uh, Greg, are you still here? Or did you leave before I started talking? <laughs> oh, you are. Okay, thanks. Uh, Greg, tell me why you won't put a heat pump in a house that doesn't have wall insulation. What was your feedback mechanism? Uh, you get a lot of callbacks. Okay. <laughs> Best way to lose money on a job is callback. <laughs> okay. So gas furnaces blow lots of nice hot air. And they can make people comfortable even with cold surfaces surrounding them. We don't want cold surfaces surrounding our customers. We want warmer surfaces. An uninsulated wall is a cold surface in the wintertime. Okay? So please, you know, I don't know the rules to your programs, but if you do have the opportunity to air seal and weatherize that house first, your customers are going to be a lot happier with the pumps. Okay, so 
How do I know if the walls are insulated? Uh, removing the outlet cover and citing a non-conductive, that's an important part, a non-conductive probe <laughs> into the wall. Plastic crochet hooks. I was doing a training last week and the homeowner had chopsticks. Turns out they work just great. So if you want to know if there's insulation in there, look for telltale signs that maybe somebody did you know, a fill from the outside. Did anybody have infrared cameras? <laughs> really cool. Awesome. That's even better. Um, yeah. Is there a question? Okay. So here we get back to that solar heat gain coefficient. And it's weird. I said it's the percentage of solar radiation that hit the outside pane and enters the inside of the house. It's actually compared to a single pane piece of clear glass. So a single pane piece of clear glass has a solar heat gain coefficient of one. So those of you that work in new construction, you have this nice label on the window that tells you all that information, right? You're not going to know that. In the Northwest, solar heat gain coefficient usually matches the unit value really close. So if you got a double pane final window low E, chances are it's for the U value. Chances are the solar heat gain coefficient is really close to 0.4. If you have a double pane metal slider, the U value is probably like 0 0.60. Solar heat gain coefficient is going to be pretty close to. Point six. Point six. Okay. And this makes a really big difference on the cooling. A really, really big. So this is say I have, I have 100 square feet of west facing glass, and there's a Walmart 10 feet from my house. How much solar radiation is going to hit that glass? Not much. <laughs> you can account for that in your heat gain calculations. So Manual J process, which again is addition and multiplication, has been proven to oversize cooling loads by about 20%. The thumb is already on the scale. You do not need to put your foot on the same scale or you're really oversizing, okay? Basements. Are you planning on conditioning the basement? Maybe. maybe. Yeah, maybe it's already been decided for you, right? People are living down there. Or maybe it's one of those basements your kids are afraid to go into, you know, and the floor is already insulated. The floor, the first floor, so the ceiling of the basement's insulated. Maybe it's already been decided. So you got to decide when you're going to condition it. My guess is most times in Portland, it's probably going to be conditioned. Uh, how many feet above or below grade? When it's 20 degrees outside, what's the soil temperature two feet below grade? About 45, maybe 50, something like that, right? So you have less heat loss below grade. Okay. <laughs> Greg, would you put a heat pump in this house? I'll pay you. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> So, how will you type the houses? You all do lower doors, keep up the good work, okay? Keep up the good work. Um, if not, these are some estimates based on testing of hundreds of thousands of homes in the Northwest that we kind of have averages for, okay? So, pre-World War I, we built homes out of one by twos. You know, lath and plaster and all these weird wall configurations. And then we started build, you know, making the suburbs. We got plywood and sheet box that came in four by eight material. Suddenly homes got a lot tighter. So one winter ACA, summer's always good in the AC. Everybody understand what ACH is, just air changes rate, air change per hour. We all good on that definition. Okay. Um these are pretty good. Don't do one, don't enter one. Don't enter two, don't enter three for almost anything. Unfortunately, a lot of software out there ask you a lot of subjective questions, like how many fireplaces are in this house? Tell me about the quality of the paint job. What day of the week is it? And all of a sudden, they give you an ACH rate of three and you're completely unaware of it. 
I hate software programs that's not specifically spell out what the error exchange rate is and what the duck multiplier is. Okay, duck multiplier. So all that is, after you add everything together, it says we're going to add 10% to it. That's a low duck multiplier. If your ducks are outside the house, 10% is about as good as you can get. It's leakage and conduction. Okay? So literally, it adds it on. In a lot of software programs, you can get that number up to 100%. And you might not even know it. <laughs> That's the scary part. Always know what your duck multiplier is. Uh, all right. it, it, it's okay. They, they, they have solar. It's okay. <laughs> From a thermodynamic point of view, in the middle of summer, it's better to have in your front yard than your attic. <laughs> Granted, it's not the best place to have it. But yeah, it's, you know, I would say if it's outside the house, 10% is about as good as you can get it. 20% is going to be pretty leaky. And one of the things that pains me in other programs that get incentives for heat pumps, no requirement to even look into the ducts. I need to speak up. Okay. If I if I purposely speak loud, do I, am I okay? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay, sorry. Thanks for the heads up. I'll face the crowd and talk loud. Okay, fix the ducts. <laughs> if they're outside the house, fix the ducts. Okay, I'm gonna read through this slowly. No, um, they, everybody gets this slide, right? Everybody gets the slide deck, is that right, Chris? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay, yeah. So basically this is right out of Manual J version eight. If you enter these numbers, this is what the multipliers can be. Please note, that you can get some really high multipliers <laughs> over here. 0.59. Oh my gosh, semi left, semi leaky R2. Basically a 0 0.6, a 60% increase. Treat the duct. Okay, so I admit I read weird geeky energy things. Okay. And you know, we all got problems, right? <laughs> you know. Uh, so this is one that was done by uh, University of California in Davis and published here. So this is what happens when really smart people like Dr. Madera have free labor in the terms of grad students. Okay, <laughs> What they do is they make a duct system that they can control the temperature in that room. Okay, And so they've got, they know this duct work, it's going to every place, and these are the registers in the duct system. No duct leak. This is this conduction. This is R8 duct work. So, who here likes inverter driven heat pumps? Okay, this is why ducts even matter more on inverter driven heat pumps. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to spend a little time on it. This is delivery effectiveness. That means if it was one, all the cool energy, this would apply for heat too, but all the cool energy that left the air conditioner got into the house. There's always going to be a penalty. This is capacity and airflow. So they're 100%. This is 40%. And gosh, this would be 20%. And then we have these lines, an 84 degree attic. That's not so bad, is it? 84 degrees in the attic. 95, 106, 115. Notice we don't show 140 here. <laughs> Probably because the grad students got too hot in the room and they didn't keep, keep working away, right? So, okay, 84, you know, we keep it pretty good. But look what happens at this red line when it's 106. At 100%, we're still pretty good. But by the time you get to 40% of that capacity, you're down to about 55% effectiveness. Why is that? Because each CFM is traveling slower to help that duct work. So conduction has a longer time to work on that airflow. So inverters are great, but if ducts matter on single speed systems, they matter even more on inverter driven systems. Okay. 
We are not actually going to dive into this computer today. Okay. This is a program that you have the actual address for. I know that. It's like points and nickels. So you're here. Who's eating? Uh, if you just type in HVAC sizing tool or betterbuilt.com, you'll, you'll find this tool. It's free to use. And if you use it, thank me. Okay. Thank me. Uh, it was developed with the company I currently work with for one more day. And it's an <laughs> online free access tool. It's designed to get a home entered in 15 minutes or less. Okay. So, <laughs> I look at the building house. Okay. Um, you will start, and this we call this the video game aspect up here. It will start giving you a heating and cooling load instantaneous. So you can start like, well, I'm going to change the attic and see what happens. And automatically it starts the chain. There is a lot of hover over help in it. There are underneath help. There are videos of people talking about how to use the software. So there's hover over help. There's hover over help. If you really want to learn this, it, you can get my phone number if you want. So you go through. And what's the other nice thing about this program is everything is transparent. You will know what the ACA trade is, and you will know what the depth multiplier assigned to it is. And who's ever reviewing the work will also know what it is. So it can't be hidden. Okay. So yeah, basically you you can enter a whole house or room by room, you enter windows, and then these overrides and options with limitations. <laughs> If you say your 2000, your, your house built in 2000 has an R0 wall, it's not going to let you do that. Okay, so there's limitations. And underneath this configure button, there is, you hit it once and you have heat pump library. <laughs> and you can go in and enter the capacity of the heat pump that you're actually putting in to that house. You can enter that. So I urge you to play with it. Uh, go my phone number. I will give it to you. Um, the other thing I really like about this is that if your QA provider, if you can share this information with your QA provider, you don't have to send paper back and forth. They can go online and look at it in the database without sending screenshots to each other. Okay, so... What this will also do, if I go in the right direction, is this is a balance point calculation. Manual S, or the gentleman back in that corner that was talking about manual S. Yeah, there we go. So <laughs> this is the heat loss of the building. Uh, you know, this is temperature, outside temperature. And sure enough, the, cold, the warmer it gets, the less BTUs per square foot it needs to maintain a comfortable heat load. Make sense? The colder it is, the more heat loss it is. Okay, the thing about inverter driven heat pumps is that they have a big range, but they can have a big range. This is the high capacity, this is the low capacity. So, this one, and so have, we have a defined balance point, have we? I was just gonna say. Okay, balance point. Balance point is the lowest outside temperature your heat pump can heat the house before it needs the backup electric stroke heat pumps. Okay? So in this case, with this heat pump, which is a cold climate heat pump, oops, it is, it can heat the house all the way down to like, I'll call it 15 degrees. Is that lower than 23 degrees? Okay. So what we don't want to do is when we're at 40 degrees, is hammer that heat pump coming on, coming on, coming off, coming on, on and off, you know, the cycle. So the low capacity is just as important as selecting an inverter driven heat pump as the high capacity. We don't want that line down at 30 degrees, especially important. We probably want that line, you know, I'd probably rather see this line right here at 45. Here's the secret about inverter driven heat pumps. Where do you get the best efficiency, the highest coefficient of performance? Low speed. On the low speed. We can get COPs of four to five down here. 
unless we oversize it on the low end and things just doing this all, all day long. Uh-oh. Uh, okay. So, uh, <laughs> Nicholas asked me to say something about latent cooling load in Portland, Oregon in the summertime. And I said, why? <laughs> and then he explained it. Because there's this myth in our industry that 60% of your cooling capacity is sensible and 40% is latent. Sensible is that stuff you can sense. That's the stuff you read on a normal thermometer. You know, yeah, it's, it's the air temperature, essentially. The latent, how many people have gone to say Louisiana in August? <laughs> Did you like being outdoors? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I melt in Louisiana <laughs> in the summertime, right? So the whole reason after Emmanuel J got started is because people were putting air conditioners in hot humid climates. And they got complaints. So what did they do? They put bigger air conditioners in. <laughs> They are cooled down, so they heat, they've got cold and muggy. So we don't live in Louisiana. We don't even live in Maine. We don't even live in Ohio. You know, basically in America, if you love if you live north of that big bathtub called the Gulf of Mexico, you have miserable summers in there. <laughs> you get this hot and muggy there, right? Out on the West Coast, you got great summers. Great summers, you know, like here, you know, okay. Hot, really humid. Phoenix, really blazing hot. <laughs> hot and really dry. You know, basically, we're in the hot and really dry. And I continually get push push and I thank Nicholas for pointing out that contractors will say, hey, only 60% of us. How many people are old enough to have used this trichromic? <laughs> have you ever banged yourself in the head when you're doing this? <laughs> I have. <laughs> okay. So this is, how am I doing on time, by the way? Doing good, you got 20 minutes. Perfect, that's what that, 15, that's what that 15 minutes required. Okay, so we're, we're, we're doing good. Okay, so maybe some of you have heard the term wet bulb and dry bulb. This is where it comes from. There is a little water reservoir here and there is a cotton sock, it has to be cotton, I'm told. So that's the wet bulb and that's the dry bulb. And you twirl it. What happens to the water on the socks if you're in Phoenix? Yeah. It evaporates, and as the water evaporates, it cools the wet bulb. What happens when I'm in Louisiana in the summertime? Not it, probably, it probably picks up moisture. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't evaporate, right? So that's how you get wet bulb and dry bulbs. The bigger the difference is between the dry bulb and the wet bulb, the dry business, the smaller the difference. The mud Okay, sensible cooling load. So yeah, late when we work flat work definition is hidden, sort of like that hidden thing we have to take away, right? It, it involves this is what makes condensate in the summertime. That's why I have water running out. Yeah, because that indoor air is hitting a cold coil, hitting that dew point, and turning into water. And that's running out that PVC pipe. Okay. So we don't have to worry about latent load where we live. Okay. So why is manual S? Don't do we get the manual S again? They are paranoid <laughs> about never oversizing air conditioning, even if you're putting an heat pump in, because of their origin story, <laughs> where they want to make people comfortable in sun. If we end up oversizing air conditioning a little bit here, don't grotesquely oversize it. It's not that big a thing. Because we don't have to worry about removing that much moisture. Okay. So, yes, another confusing graph. Stay with me. Okay, this is total and sensible capacity. This is how much cools it can remove in an hour. So, every time you look at this data, it will, you know, there's a competition every year with the manufacturers of HVAC equipment. It's a million dollar prize. 
given to the engineer that can give you their total capacity tables in the most confusing way possible. <laughs> this is the only explanation for the weirdness and non-uniformity that we find out there. Okay, so total capacity. Okay, there we go. This is like a three-ton unit to me. And here we have different indoor wet bulbs. Again, the lower that indoor wet bulb is, the drier it is. Okay, so let's pick on this 59 wet bulb, uh, 59 indoor wet bulb, which is kind of what we see. And or notice that out of this 32.3 total capacity, almost all of it is sensible capacity. It's going to lower that temperature flow. Is anybody actually from Louisiana here? I'm sorry. <laughs> <You're not. laughs> if I say Alabama, is <laughs> you're not insulted. <laughs> okay. Okay. This is all take a trip down to Baton Rouge. Okay. So wow, 71 degree wet bulb. We would all be swearing if we were inside of a 71 degree wet bulb. Okay. So here we are, 71, and a seven. My gosh, only one ton of it is available is available to you to lower the temperature of that house. <laughs> Almost two tons is ringing out that dang air. Okay, mm -hmm. this is sort of why we get this high up to 40% of the capacity is always going to be late. No, look at the 59 degree wet bulk. That's what's going to happen. Matter of fact, you can even get lower than that. Especially if that gets hot and that air conditioner has been running all day. It's really, really hot. water out of that air. It's dry. Okay. So here's an example of a million dollar prize winner. Okay. So this is a carrier product some time ago. So condenser, entering air temperature. That's outside. The 95. Oh, they even offer it. This is a two ton unit. They even offer it at different CFM totals. How come I'm not seeing, say, 600 CFM here? It started 800. Did you kill your compressor? You killed your compressor, but you found them. You found a greater CFM a ton out there. I know you have, right? So 800 CFM. Our entering wet bulb is 57. Our sensible capacity is 20. Right? But notice if it was 72. It only be about one ton. So, hot dry summers. Here's another way of describing it that, that Trey used to use, sort of the, the same sort of information. But of course, the Trey is in a different manner because we have to keep it confusing. Okay, so where did this 60 40 split come from? I did some research. <laughs> and some some manufacturers, this is how they list it. And sure enough, let's see, we've got a 36 hips, we've got a three ton unit because that 36 right there, right? Net sensible is 21.6. That's about a 60 40 split. But look at the conditions that 60 40 split is at 80 degrees inside, a dry bulb of 67. That's not where we live. So don't dig into the detailed capacity tables. Your, your distributors can help you on it. Most of the stuff's online these days. <laughs> okay. 15 minutes for questions? I got it. Okay. You got a comment. Go ahead. Yeah, so on the first W show sure multiple different air flows capable. And everybody goes, oh, 400 CFM controls. That's what I need to move. Well, it's just like you fit across the piece of template. If you do have high latent loads, you run a lower CFM, you have right. a higher latent component. And if you need a higher sensible component, you might be at 450%. Oh, I, I, absolutely. I, I have buddies that live in the dry part of California. They design air conditioning systems for 500 CFM per time. Yeah. I don't know if we necessarily design heat pump for that. <laughs> they throw down a house, he's had a little purse, he's a bunch of spray. Any other questions? Um, 
I go into houses where there's a heat pump installed before they did any insulation, um, but they had already planned on the insulation, but the HVAC company didn't take the out that one day and didn't enter in their load count. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak to the importance of like kind of like crude by it a little bit, but that whole house system, like and really putting that all in when you're doing the HVAC out, even if it's going to be in something that takes months for the next or a month. Hopefully, and those of you that know program rules, please correct me <laughs> if I'm saying anything wrong. I think as grantees, you have the ability to bid an insulation package, an air sealing package, along with an HVAC package. Is that correct? Along with the new Steve water heater, right? Okay. So, did that sort of answer your question at all? Sort of, kind of, maybe. That's the direction you want to be moving. That's the direction you want to be moving. Okay. You want an old house approach. So. So you want to uh, replace your gas furnace to uh, you know uh, electric heat pump. Um, what do you recommend? It has to be insulated first. Let's see if it's not enough budget to do the whole project, right? Uh, replace the uh, electric heat pump. Insulation maybe it has nothing to do with suddenly the budget of the grantees is not enough to do the, the whole project. What do you suggest to do? Let's see, to replace the uh, lighting like pump, but the focus on that is because basically it plays up and we get more the heating and cooling, or you know, what you what, what, what can do. And again, program folks, <laughs> correct me if I get this one wrong. Okay. Um, you know, hopefully there is. Sufficient budget to sort of get it all done at once. No, you're telling me. I, I didn't say hope. Oh, we're ready. We are moving in that direction. We are moving in that direction. Okay. You know, I, I, you know, honestly, even though I was an HVAC contractor, in my heart, I'm like, if you got a low R value any place in the wall, start there. You know, I think that's where we make the biggest improvement. Start with the little bar numbers. You know, the chance are maybe the utility to the attic and floors, you know, 10 years ago, but left the wall because it's complicated. Chances are the ducts aren't sealed. You know, that that's sort of I, I hesitate to call it low line fruit because it's hard work. <laughs> you know, but to me it's the base case. And then when you know what the finished product is, that's when you can come in and properly size and select the best heat pump for the house. And just a quick question. Let's see if we do the walls, for example, and then we do the units. And then maybe next year, they do the upgrade for the attic, uh, duct seal, windows, whatever. Uh, it is any way, I'm not in fact, it is any way the unit could be, let's see, we did the wall calculation for this size. You know, just to do the whole injection. What happened when next year later, everything is set up and then done and upgraded and everything. This unit is oversized now because of the unit comment that. Uh, uh, he, you know, done. yeah. So let me see if I got your question right. Okay. So what you're saying is you only get to do the walls now or whatever. What, what mm -hmm. and, and you size the heat pump for how the house is today. What will the negative effect be on the heat pump years to go? Depending on how overpriced it is, it could really lower the efficiency. And you know, I I sort of like the idea. You know, if it, if it's a couple of years, it might not be too bad. <laughs> you know, because that heat pump should be there hopefully like for twenty years, right? So yeah, you know, I understand scheduling. It's not always easy. Any more questions? Who wants? Who would like? A guided tour of HVAC. Oh yes, sir. I'm sorry. Can I raise your hand? Yeah, but the day, I'm kind of, I'm kind of just wondering, like, if you're not able to completely insulate the, the envelope properly, how can you properly size it? I mean, you kind of answered it, but it's still like, and eh. <laughs> yeah, it, you know, can you, can you repeat the past question? Yeah, you, 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 you bet. I, I think it was. Sort of along the same line as the, the along the line. Yeah, along the same line. 
So this is say you can't do it for. Is it a budget issue you can't do it for, or is it this? I would, I would presume that it, it's a budget issue. It, it's, yeah. If it's not being done, it's a budget issue. Okay, it, it is a budget issue. You know, if I knew walls were never going to get insulated, <laughs> I might listen to what Greg said. Okay. You know, <laughs> but if I'm going to put a heat pump in, I'm going to do all I can to get walls. Okay. Yes, sir. You can. The, the, the other thing we have not discussed at all, especially if we're putting in heat pumps that have auxiliary heat backup, is sizing that auxiliary heat, okay? It's crazy to have 20 kW worth of backup heat. It's crazy to have 15 kW worth of backup heat. That just, one, it's gonna drive your electrical costs way up, you know, just, just to get that panel upgrade, right? And there's, there's two schools of thought on this. One is say I have a balance point and it's 30 degrees. All I want to do when it gets below 30 degrees is have that compressor continue to run and some of that auxiliary heat to come in and help out the compressor. Portland, Oregon, that's probably only 5 kW. And it's really, how many people have installed heat pumps here without any backup heat whatsoever? How's it working out for you? Fine. Fine. There are some contractors that can't give up that that you know that security blank <laughs> of uh, that really big toaster you have in there, right? <laughs> What's the backup heat for a gas furnace? No. <laughs> Nothing, right? <laughs> yeah, it <was> cold. <laughs> you know, but you feel like we have <laughs> what, what, you, what, what did you say it's not as funny? <laughs> what? Sweater. <laughs> there you go. Sweater. Um so you know, I wish I could give some kind of magic definitive answer on what house to design. But you know, if you do think it's going to get you know, all service levels insulated and the ducts are going to size it for the way that house will be in a few years. Okay. And educate the homeowner. Okay. You know, I'll just throw one other piece in there. It's like every project needs to have a sort of review. And we've got an amazing team that can help you sort through these problems. Or issues and problems. Um, so we, you know, every house you have to make hard choices, and um, you know, with these stuff in the open market, etc. And so you have to, you have to make those choices, and decisions with thought, and looking at the whole picture. There's, there's not an easy answer, but the, the easiest answer is Jason and Gray. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Nice. Jason and Gray. Looking for a general guidance here. Say you've got a typical one story or two story house in Portland, and you're looking at fuel switching. They've got a gas or oil furnace. Um, switch that with a central heat pump system or go dust. I have a bias here. <laughs> if the existing duct system is in pretty good shape, there might be some duct modification. They are used to having a register in each room. My bias would be to find the best fit central system for there, knowing that can't always be the case. That would be my bias. We'll show the basement. We really don't want to disconnect conditioning the basement. Yeah. You can have a lot of problems in our climate if you pull the conditioning out of the basement. I mean, you can't do I've seen people put many split systems in a basement, but it'd be better to keep it central and keep the air moving through there and keep the, the temperature getting down there because you could have that place is just a magnet for moisture problems if you pull the heating system out. A magnet for moisture. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm gonna if you want, how many people would like a personal guided tour of HVAC stream? Nobody? Okay, good. Okay. I mean, that, that, that was that online size until HF Street. Uh, yeah. But what's your operating? How many people would like to be able to have a personalized 15 minute lesson on how to use HF Street? Okay, I'll give you my phone number. <laughs> I'm only reason I'm giving you my phone number is because hardly anybody ever called me. <laughs> okay. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> there are, and this is one. I, before you give me a call, 
please go to the site. You will see recorded webinars of me and Christopher Diamond playing click and clap, basically. And happy. <laughs> Old Rapper, thank you for laughing, older people. Yeah. The website would be nice for you just wanted to do it because that <laughs> what you mentioned, I went on there. There's definitely stuff I'm still learning to do that tool. But what I find is there's a lot of stuff in there that if you don't give it the right answer, it kills you. And then I have to call Jason because I can't move forward with my game. Okay. So maybe we can have a webinar sometime. Yes. Okay, maybe we can have a webinar. Anyway, if you okay, webinar sounds like a great idea. Meanwhile, let me give out my phone number, okay? And then I'll answer your question. Okay. It's uh like I said, I know most of you don't call me. It's uh one. 900. <laughs> <laughs> 541-517-5779. And if I don't recognize the number, I'm actually way more likely to pick it up than I say. <laughs> Do you have any uh, general comments on uh, deconstructing multi families? Uh, in the Northwest, it tends to be ductless, and oversizing is a real concern. <laughs> Just because, I mean, you know, there's, yeah, each individual appointment might only have like two heat loss services. We need, we need to probably get the smallest one we can. And again, check for capacity. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And the west side of the building, west facing windows might require a different size than those units face north. It's good to that cool thing. Yeah. So I want to follow up on that question. I, I gotta okay. get to this because I just didn't catch the name of the tool. Oh, it's a. Uh, you want to find it? It's, a, it's better built Northwest. That's on their website. It's a NIA website. Honestly, via Google, HVAC sizing tool, better built. Look, you'll find it. Okay. Okay. We just sent out the the URL to the end slide. Oh, there. Oh, it's on there. Hey, yeah. somebody looked at the notes. I <laughs> three. <laughs> Thank you. And, yes, sir. So, what are the minimum program requirements for these load calculations? A lot of these incentive programs require load calculations, but on large multifamily, it's such that it's irrelevant because the size is even better for protecting. Program questions. <laughs> Tell me how program folks. Can you repeat the question? Like, what are the minimum program requirements for doing load calculations? Because for large multifamily projects, doing a load calculation is essentially ir irrelevant because the unit selection size is based on the refrigerant height length. Based on what? Refrigerant height length. Yeah. Because if you if you right size the unit, you, it doesn't have enough refrigerant length to put the outdoor unit where the architect wants it four floors up on a five-story building. Mm -hmm. So we're continually asked to do load calculations to you know right size the equipment. But A, it's irrelevant because it's based on refrigerant pipeline. B, the contractor doesn't want to select a dozen different types of units. <laughs> He's going to pick one size for studios, one bedrooms, right. two bedrooms, three bedrooms. So as a design engineer, we're asked to do room by room load calculations that are not relevant. And who's paying for it? So, like, my question is, what is the minimum program requirement when this is asked? Bruce, do you have a professional opinion on that? <laughs> <laughs> I would really like to go down. I'd like to come and see what that, the effect of that refrigerant piping is on the capacity. And I'm not that familiar with really long. I'm sorry. <clears throat> when I don't know the answer, I tend to whisper. Um, <laughs> What I'm saying is I don't have that much familiarity with the effect of really long line cells on the capacity. So in, in essence, what it does, typical studio unit is needing less than one ton of cooling. Yeah. But on floors two and three on a five-story building, you're upsizing that to a one and a half ton unit. Just because of the refrigerant pipeline. Yep, yep, because you're condensing it. Well, I, I would argue that that's really digging into the detailed capacity tables because you actually look at the impact. Yes. So you'd still be sizing correctly. <laughs> that's, that's a good point. Um, I can speak to that. So you saw the guy in the system go over here yes. for distribution. Mm -hmm. You actually use mm -hmm. that and use accurate line set makes. You will see how the longer you make the line set, it will derate the cooling. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't know what guy he's got, um, but they've all got engineering manual, so you can help with that. Yes, absolutely. Uh, so, no, that's exactly correct. My question then was, 
the program guidelines, right. but we still need to do room by room load calculations for multifamily. For multifamily, right. when in essence, it's driven by exactly what you just said. So, are these where they have a mechanical engineer because uh, it's multifamily commercial? Yes. Uh, the stamp? Yes. Okay. So, you're doing in house engineering? Yes. I mean, well, I am doing it. So, yeah. Yeah, I guess so. What I would say to that is, I mean, I don't understand, but I literally do the room by room and do all that for every project. It's one reason we don't have a website. We would work on referral because if well, I did that for every bid, yeah, there's not enough time in the day. Well, no, okay. And so for the project we're worked on, nobody's wanting to pay for that. So where does that factor in? Okay. I don't have an answer. Okay. <laughs> I have an um, answer, though. But yeah, right. I will say that a lot of what you heard today has been single family focused. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we totally recognize that. We are, we've got Nick and John here who haven't um, been pointed to a lot other than when they were speaking. They are with Evergreen Consulting. There are multifamily quality assurance folks. Um, we are open to uh, your feedback on how we make our guidance more multifamily specific. So I would love to have a follow-up with you um, and so that we can and build a standard, uh, a side-by-side -side standard for multifamily. Perfect. Any other quick questions? <laughs> Any other quick questions? Going once, going twice. Yeah.